Well, I'm going to tell you about our work on cyanohaps in the Indian River Lagoon. And if I can make this work, there we go. So what is a cyanohab and why did we even bother to work on this? So it's a harmful algal bloom. We heard a little bit about those uh, earlier. It's made up of cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria have always been called blue-green algae as well. And they're bacteria that are photosynthetic. But as bacteria, it turns out they're one of the types of bacteria that make, are very rich in making natural products. And some of those natural products are um, toxic, tumor-promoting, immune-suppressant, or skin-irritant compounds. And that's why we decided that we wanted to look at what some of these nasty things are. Um, we always hear about black goo and stuff like that in the river. And there was some concern that we have saxitoxin in fish, and there's this thing called lingbia, I don't even know if I want to try this, uh, lingbia woolii, which can come in from freshwater habitats, and it produces saxitoxin, which is paralytic shellfish poisoning compound. So um, we have these things that float around in the river. We didn't know what they were, and so we wanted to take a look at those. Um, I want to point out that um, not all cyanobacteria compounds are bad. Um, there is a compound uh, that's called Largazole that came from a, a cyanobacteria in the Keys that Valerie Paul and Hendrik Lusch, he's at UF, have worked on, and it's what's called an HDAC inhibitor, and it might change how we can treat cancer. So uh, one man's poison might be another person's cure for cancer. And there's other compounds we have no idea what they do. So the goal of the project, we've seen this slide a bunch of times. When we first went into this, it was 2011, and um, we wanted to look at the filamentous cyanobacteria that were at these sites where Dennis was already doing collections, and he uh, very kindly helped us, him and his group, with getting some of the samples. Um, we were hoping that the data could, you know, file back into the whole Indian River Lagoon Observatory and how, um, you know, some of the dolphin work and et cetera if there were events. In 2013, we still had some money left, so we did do a little work in the southern estuary, and I'll present that as well. So um, the general methods were that samples were collected, and I'm going to read from over there, um, in uh, spring and summer um, at mainly the Hanasek sites, but we also got some from behind my house because I get a lovely um, black, gooey, messy, gray thing that comes up behind my house, so we got that as well. In 2013, we collected at Torpy Road area, that's near me. Um, Wabasso, St. Lucie River, and the Southern Estuary. And this year, a lot of people came and told me that there was a big bloom in Wabasso. And so we went and we, well, actually, I go to Wabasso Causeway a lot. Um, it's a very pretty place. And so I collected some of that. People looked at me like I was crazy getting into that stuff, but it doesn't have anything. Samples are freeze-dried, extracted, um, and then analyzed using our LCMS. And we use LCMS MS. And, um, then we just match the, where the ions come off with the compounds to figure out which ones we think they are. This shows you some traces, and I'll try to walk us through. This is a, a total um, LCMS, and the one that we look at the most, because it's the highest abundance ions, are up here at the top. And that's an extraction of it, and you can see there's little numbers. That's the mass of the compound. And we can compare that to what we know should, we should see for known compounds. And this just shows an example of a floating mat versus a benthic sample, and this came from the Torpy Road area. Some of the compounds that we see, um, this top one is malingolide, and um, it actually affects quorum sensing. That's the only activity we know. Quorum sensing is a, a bacterial communication system. Um, we also saw a little bit of this malingolamide E, which has cytotoxicity and lingbia bell and G in some of the floating mats. Every floating mat has malingolite, even this last one from Wabasso. That was the major compound present in that one. Um, microcolon A, down there at the end, is a very cytotoxic and immune suppressant compound, and that's present in the benthic ones at um, Torpy Road. And that was one of the ones that I kept thinking maybe could get accumulated up and could be a problem, perhaps, for dolphin. But it was pretty temporal, um, the bloom. Let's see if I can get this. So now 2013, if you read the newspaper, and even today, if you read the newspaper, you'll hear that there were toxic algal blooms that were covering the entire Indian River Lagoon uh, or southern estuary. And this is some of the pictures you'll see. Um, this is, let me see, the black goo, which I went down to try to find some of this black goo so I could test it. And it was already gone just a couple days after it showed up in the newspaper. I probably went about two miles up and down walking in the water trying to find this. Um, I spoke with Dennis Hanisak, and he said, well, these things can be very temporal. They come up, and they go away very rapidly, and that seems to be the case. We went down to the southern lagoon quite a few times looking for this green fluorescent uh, thing. You can see this is really very bad. This one, I can never find where it is. This is, I believe, at Rio. 
Um, we never actually saw anything quite like this, um, although we did look quite a bit. What we actually saw was lots of brown water, and um, everywhere we went there was lots of brown water, and when we checked the salinity, we went to almost every public park that we could easily get to down in that area, um, both up the, uh, the northern St. Lucie River and, and in from Palm City, and um, the salinity was about zero in most of the places. The one place we did find it is uh, Shepherd's Park. And you can see, if you look very carefully, there is some of that green fluorescent thing, and that's a jar that has some in. It wasn't very much. There was a woman who lived right next door to the park, and she was very kind and let us go on her property where there was actually a little bit more of a bloom. And she said it had been much uh, more dense um, at that time. The other place was Josh uh, told us to go to Sandsprit Park. And sure enough, uh, at Sandsprit Park, there was a nice green bloom just in one of the boat ramps. And when we were there, there was actually fishermen cleaning their nets out. And so maybe some of the nutrients right in that area were coming from that. We analyzed these. And um, the one at Shepherd's Park, I know this is incredibly hard to see, but there is actually an eye, and it says 995. Boy, it looks terrible up there. Um, which would be this compound, microcystin LR, which is the compound that um, has been reported before and is actually a hepatotoxin. And um, really, microcystin is a freshwater um, cyanobacteria, and you see the real problems are in uh, farm ponds, and cows go in and drink it, and then it destroys their uh, livers. But if you, and there are cases where dogs have been poisoned by getting this on their fur and then and eating it. So in fact, at Shepherd's Park, we did see that compound. When we were at Sandsprit Park, um, the salinity was different. It was 12 parts per thousand, and we see no signs of this. But there's a report by Valerie Paul and um, Cliff Ross that the microcystis will actually release the compounds when it's under stress conditions, and so probably under higher salinity, it's releasing it. But it may not still be a big issue because there were about 500 million gallons of water flowing <laughs> through that area, I'm guessing. So I don't think there was high concentrations, even if it was released. Um, another project we worked on, and I don't know where my time is, but it's on BMAA. So Brian uh, LaPointe had come to us and said that uh, you know he wanted to see if we could set up an assay for BMAA. It's beta-methyl-amino-L-alanine, and it's this little uh, compound here at the bottom. It's been implicated, well, first, that it's produced by all cyanobacteria. Second, that it's a neurotoxin. Third, that it's been implicated in the native population in Guam getting um, an ALS or Lou Gehrig's-like syndrome, Parkinson's-type disease, and that it can be accumulated in the food chain and in uh, the Miami area where there were cyanobacterial blooms, they were showing that blue crabs appeared to have very large amounts of this. It's also been shown that in people dying of Alzheimer's disease, their brains have a larger concentration of BMAA. So we wanted to set up an assay for this, and this is all the work of Priscilla Winder in my lab. The problems with looking at BMAA is that it's a small, very small molecular weight compound. It has no UV or anything that you can use to detect it. And there are lots of other compounds that are very similar in structure and molecular weight. And so it's very easy to confuse it, and especially with this thing called uh, DAB, or diaminobutanoic acid. They almost come off together in chromatography. So it's, it's problematic to look at BMAA, but we decided to, to give it a shot. We used a method that just came out in 2013, and it was an extension of earlier work, but where they actually use a, um, a reagent that you react with the amino acids, and then you get a derivatized compound, which you then analyze by mass spec, and then you have um, this compound, and when you do MSMS on it, you get 258, and on this one, which is the main one that overlaps, you get 188, and so you can analyze. And Priscilla was able to do that. And not only that, but she's really, really good. So she was able to actually get them separated from each other. And if you could see, this is actually the ions you expect for BMAA and for DAB. And you can actually quantitate it. She also found things, though, that you have to be very careful about the matrix. And you have to do additions and standard curves in the matrix. And it's a very um, time-consuming analysis. Overall conclusions you know, from this project, which is now um, over, is that there are lots of cyanobacterial blooms, some of them worse than others. Um, some of them happen naturally. There's one that happens at the inlet all the time that Valerie Paul's group at Smithsonian has been studying. And it's right at the inlet. So it probably doesn't have any really negative effects. Um, maybe even the ones floating behind my house are just a natural thing. 
Um, others where we've dumped in a lot of water, we end up, they're a really good marker that you have uh, impacted the environment, in my opinion. With the BMAA, it's a non-trivial thing to do. We can do it. If anyone wants us to analyze some and they have the funds to pay for it, we're happy to do it. Um, and that's, I guess, I'm done. Oh, wait, wait, I want to acknowledge some people before I do that. Dennis and Kristen for collecting, and Dennis, Brian, Valerie, and Nicholas for interesting discussions and helping, and the specially licensed plate for funding it. <laughs>